Hi, Girish. Thank you so much for coming to the Investor Talk. How are you? Pleasure. I'm very well, uh, Max. Thank you so much for having me here. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks for your time. If you want to give an introduction yourself to the founders, listeners. Sure. Uh, so my name is Girish Shivani. I am one of the general partners at an early stage venture capital fund called Glornest, based out of India. Uh, uh, we are uh, about 10 years old now into our third fund, uh, uh, the coin uh, from a $75 million pool of capital. Uh, uh, we are still in the fundraise mode. We've already raised about 80% of that. Uh, we've already invested from fund three in uh, about seven companies. Uh, uh, our thesis is very sharp. We primarily do deep tech, IP-led, uh, innovation-led opportunities, which are selling to the enterprises, uh, building in India, but uh, building for the world and selling in the global markets. Uh, because we think there's a, a lot of engineering uh, talent in India and uh, you can build in India uh, what you would typically, uh, for, for a dollar, what would typically take five to eight dollars to build in, uh, in, in the developed world. Uh, uh, with that thesis, we have clearly articulated two separate lines of uh, deep tech, as we call them. One is this entire hardware space where we look at opportunities in the domain of uh, uh, our, uh, hardware, uh, wearables, uh, industrial IoT, uh, robotics, uh, etc. And then on this entire software leg around AI, ML, immersive technologies, application of blockchain technologies, enterprise SaaS. Uh, as I said, the focus is primarily enterprise leg. Uh, so we very rarely do consumer facing opportunities. So that's what we do. We've been here for 10 years. Uh, uh, we are among one of the uh, uh, you know, fairly well known funds, pre series A funds out of India. Uh, uh, we have very strong deal flow. We get to see about 300 opportunities every month. Uh, in our domain, we get to see nine out of 10 opportunities that get funded in our investment thesis. So that's what we've done in the last 10 years in terms of, of getting the fund right up there in the minds of the founders uh, you know, for, for them to approach us from an investment perspective. Thank you, Girish. Me, it, you are based in India. Where exactly geographically are you more exposed? Where do you invest more? Yeah, so uh, we are fairly geographically diverse. Uh, you know, when I say amongst the top five cities in the in the country, uh, so about uh, one third of our portfolio sits out of uh, NCR, which is Delhi, Gurgaon, uh, Noida, uh, that well. About one third sits out of Bangalore. Uh, we have a few overseas investments across the earlier two funds that we did as well, uh, and the rest is split between Hyderabad, Chennai, Mumbai, Pune. Uh, so that's pretty much our geographical footprint and that's where the early stage ecosystem in india is prevalent as well we are now there are early signs now of you know tier two cities like Ahmedabad, jaipur indore etc coming up on the map uh yeah but we've still we have yet to find any opportunities in those uh, geographical areas how much you normally invest so our sweet spot max is uh half a million to a million dollars to start with uh, uh, we have gone up to a million and a half also. We are typically a pre-series A investor, uh, you know, first round of capital, institutional capital. Uh, we come in at a stage when there is at least product market fit, revenue model validation is in place, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so that's the sweet spot, but we also do, uh, you know, we've done a few early stage pre-revenue deals as well. We've we written half a million kind of checks. We've also done one or two late stage deals where we came in at a, you know, 15, 18 million dollar valuation kind of structure, more like Series A, you know, uh, than pre Series A. But uh, if, uh, if I were to look at it, you know, throughout the 40 investments that we've done, the median will be in the range of about $800,000. Thank you. Me, as an early investor, what are the top concerns and where do you find convention with investing the product, the team, the, the company? Where do you see the most value? Yeah, so I think. Uh, at early stage, I think it's all about the team. You know, we are of the firm belief that, uh, you know, a grade A team uh, can you turn even a grade B product around and a grade B will, team will uh, eventually run even a grade A product into the ground. You know, so a lot of focus goes on uh, evaluating teams, founders, etc. In fact, we are the only fund in the country where we have a full-time GP, uh, you know, uh, my partner Sanjay Pandey, whose uh, only, uh, you know, call to action is to interact with founders, uh, their first line, uh, you know, help uh, get uniformity of vision within the founder group, uh, hire the right set of people for as first line, 
make sure that the culture in the organization, the you know, is is in sync with you know, uh, uh, nurture capital. Uh, that's the philosophy that we kind of embrace very openly, uh, because in our case, capital is only a small chunk of what we bring to the table. You know, there's a lot of value add that we bring uh, in, in terms of the portfolios that we work with, uh, starting from opening doors for them, getting them in front of the right set of investors getting them to hire the right set of people, helping them with their advisory board, mentor boards, uh, technology roadmaps, et cetera. You know, so uh, so in, with that ethos in mind, uh, you know, the nurturance piece, uh, we think the, the, this is all about people more than anything else. Uh, so that's the primary focus. And then comes the product, the product market fit, the size of the market, you know, the uniformity of vision of the founders, uh, their hunger, their, uh, you know, passion to solve the problem that they are working on and solving for, uh, you know, so all those are, you know, the next level things that we look at as we uh, evaluate opportunities from an investment perspective. Thank you. I mean, we are trying to get out from the pandemic. Before the pandemic was mandatory face-to-face -face with funders. Uh, during and after the pandemic, it seems to be not mandatory anymore. Actually, a lot of venture capital that are investing online on video Zoom call or whatever it is. What's your point of view? How important is face to face for you? Yeah, so when the pandemic was there, you know, uh, we made uh, I think nine or ten investments uh, between uh, Ma uh, April twenty twenty to uh, September twenty twenty one. During that time, we also did four exits. Uh, we also raised a new fund. Uh, so I think uh, remote uh, became de rigueur at that point in time. But as the world is opening, you know, uh, I realize that people are missing that touch, uh, you know, that human element that comes into evaluation. It is very different, uh, you know, uh, uh, evaluating a team over Zoom versus evaluating them while you're sitting with, in their offices, in their rooms. You know, a lot of nuances like body language and, you know, uh, you know, their comfort in, uh, in having a chat with the, uh, uh, with the venture capitalists. Uh, you know, comes out very clearly when you are sitting in a room with them. Uh, so I think there is clearly value in 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 face to face. Uh, you know, and and we think uh, we are hoping that you know the world goes back to normal quickly, and uh, you know more more of this face to face starts to happen uh, sooner than later. We've done a few uh, since the uh, since uh, you know, the world kind of opened uh, in September October of last year. Uh, we've done uh, we've done seven investments. All of them were face to face. You know, thought we went, uh, you know, and visited the founders. The founders came and visited us. Uh, we onboarded NIF as an anchor cap anchor invested in our third fund, which is a sovereign fund in India. They committed twenty percent of the capital, and most of that due diligence happened face to face. Uh, you know, so I think I think the world is getting back to normal, and and we are liking it. I mean, after investing, how often do you like to meet the founders? Yeah, so uh, you know, at, at a, uh, in a as in a physical meeting, you know, there is a mandate internally to at least do uh, one face-to-face -face meeting every quarter, uh, you know, with the with the analyst and the lead partner uh, and the founder. Uh, that kind of went for a toss uh, during the pandemic, uh, but we are now getting back to uh, that discipline. Uh, generally, uh, you know, we would typically have, uh, especially in the early part of the investment cycle, when we are probably the largest investor on the cap table. We would uh, typically speak to the founder literally every week. You know, uh, there is definitely two touchdowns that happen, one every 15 days and one every month, uh, you know, to to evaluate the progress of the opportunity, the directionally where it is headed, how are they tracking on the North Star metrics, what kind of help and support do they need, you know, with that kind of, uh, you know, uh, end goal. Uh, so that's how often we do it. As uh, companies raise subsequent rounds of capital and, you know, superior investors come on the cap table, that engagement kind of, you know, reduces. But even then, we, you know, we have board seats in most of the cases or we have board observer seats. So we make sure that, you know, at least when those meetings are happening, we are physically or virtually present. I mean, be an early investor, how involved do you get with your portfolio and how do you try to add value to them? It is such a yeah. big thing. Yeah, so as I said, you know, our, our entire ethos is built around nurture capitalism you know so for us uh, you know uh, getting a company into the portfolio it's a 10 year relationship or a 8 year relationship that you are getting into you know so uh, and and we also realize that as financial investors we win when they win 
you know so it's an our interest to ensure their victory in the marketplace right so whatever is required uh, you know that we need to do uh, to help them you know go conquer the market we are happy to do and as i said you know that starts from not only giving capital but also you know opening doors for them getting them in front of the right set of investors you know making sure they hire the right set of people helping them set processes culture within the organization we have a 100 day playbook that we run past uh, you know as soon as we come on board which includes you know policies processes uh, uh, you know that need to go in as part of the onboarding process of the portfolio company into the portfolio uh, so there's a lot of effort and work uh, you know that goes in uh, and hand holding that goes in a lot of these founders you know are leaving jobs you know their understanding of the entrepreneurial ecosystem you know sometimes is limited you know sometimes there are two techies their understanding of the sales cycles is you know uh, constrained you know so we get them the right enterprise sales guys uh, you know uh, advisory board mentor all that is in the realm of doable uh, uh, you know we tell we tell our founders that you know uh, don't even uh, look at the clock when you call us you know and if you think there is anything that you need uh, you know help with feel free to pick up the phone and have a chat you know these fortnightly monthly touch sounds you know one of the key uh, you know uh, offer that we put to the table is actually going out and asking them how can we help you yeah. so that's how, that's the kind of ethos we've built uh, within the portfolio management team as well and you know, all our analysts the principals etc cetera, etc cetera, are tuned to that you know uh, that nurture capital uh, ethos that we've tried to build I mean, be one of the first venture capitalists in uh, the biggest in uh, India. Do you prefer to lead your rounds? In the, uh, so, uh, so as I said, we are we have, we've also learned uh, you know our lessons, right? We are now in the third fund. We've been doing this for ten years. Uh, uh, in the, when we were doing the first fund, we we led most of the rounds and we actually owned most of the rounds, and we realized that that was not such a uh, you know smart strategy. So, you know, so from fund two. we have uh, you know we have uh, out of the 19 companies that we invested in fund to we led 17 but we got uh, you know our peers to come in as co-investors you know uh, and uh, and we said that it is uh, always better to have more uh, sets of eyes to look at the opportunity holistically get more uh, you know large investors on the cap table it eases the journey of the founder as he wants strives to raise more uh, you know subsequent rounds of capital as they scale up Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, we would typically lead about 75 80% of the rounds and we would participate uh, you know uh, with other lead investors we are you know leading to my mind is a is a vanity metric you know at the end of the day it does not matter whether you, whether you lead or you don't lead as long as you are able to get a get a place on a cap table in a good company and you are able to add value to the founder's life i guess that is more important Uh, what about the next round Be, as you get in quite early uh, are you going to help the funders when it to go to the next round and do you, do you give them some introduction for example yeah yeah, yeah. so so uh, within the fund we have a thesis of uh, you know uh, putting a 2 rupee 2 dollars aside for every dollar we put to work in the first round so i have enough dry powder to continue to invest in these opportunities especially the ones which are winning in the marketplace right Uh, you know this business is about backing the winning horses right uh, and we follow that uh, to the hill uh, we uh, you know and and when these guys are raising subsequent rounds of capital we are happy to participate uh, you know if they are doing well we will typically do super pro ratas we will make introductions with our peers uh, with our you know with, with uh, series a series b investors we made introduction with investment bankers who can help you know uh, help the help the founders to go out and raise capital you know so we do all that stuff all that uh, you know especially for companies that are doing well in the portfolio you know sky is the limit in terms of uh, you know the kind of capital they can potentially raise and we will you know so there are opportunities in the portfolio where we participated in all the four or five rounds that the company raised I me mean, how do you expect your portfolio playing together should your startups in your portfolio having some interactions for example yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so for example every you know so there was a, there was we were, we were literally meeting uh, you know definitely once a year sometimes more frequently with the portfolio uh, but then pandemic you know uh, put a spanner in the works there so we now started uh, you know uh, meeting every uh, at least we now started uh, let's see how frequently we do this the intent is to at least do a mixer every quarter 
you know, in top in the top three four cities where our founders are present, you know, get them in front of you know our LPs, our investors, our you know uh, our peers, etc., uh, and give them that exposure. Uh, we always encourage uh, you know uh, our portfolio companies utilizing you know products and services of other portfolio companies. You know, we actually encourage that. You know, and uh, because because then that becomes like a internal sales cycle literally for the portfolio company, and they can use some of these as test beds as well. So we encourage all that stuff, and uh, the intent is to continue to socialize or intermingle with the the, the, the portfolio founders. Uh, you know, so that uh, so that there is not only learning, uh, you know, but social interaction, and in that, if there is an opportunity to work together and add value to each other, why not? I mean, during the pandemic, we've been talking about pivoting almost every day. What's your take on pivoting? What's your advice to founders? Because many of them, the perception of pivoting is like failure, right? I'm going to change. So what I thought was right is actually is wrong, but it's not really that bad. Yeah, so uh, so we are of the opinion that, you know, uh, uh, fail, failing fast is not such a bad thing. Uh, you know, if you are, and, and uh, we are yet to see a business model play out uh, the way it was expected to play out in the in the original plan that we looked at you know when we when we wrote the first check you know so pivoting is uh, you know if the, if, if the product market fit is not really established and you're struggling uh, you know pivoting is okay uh, as long as you don't linger on you know you 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 know uh, fix fast fail fast as i call it you know uh, <laughs> if you think if you think there are challenges in the product market fit or in the product portfolio you fix it, you experiment. It's an iterative process at the end of the day, right? Uh, no, uh, you know, very rarely have we seen people get it first time. Right? Uh, so it's okay. Uh, I don't think there, there's a taboo in terms of pivoting. Uh, but uh, if, but if, you're, if you're going to take 18 months to realize that your product market fit is not established, uh, by the time you will be literally end of cycle from a fundraise perspective. Right? Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, that's not such a good place to be. Uh, so, so if you have to experiment, uh, do it quickly, uh, you know, get it out of the way, figure out what works, what doesn't work and move on is, is, is my advice. Uh, it's okay to do it. Uh, as I said, very rarely have you seen somebody, uh, you know, within 18 months actually being at the same place that he was 18 months ago. Thank you so much, Giris. Uh, let me ask you, that's personal. Why did you become an investor? <sighs> so, uh, that's a very interesting story, actually, you know, so... I unabashedly call myself an accidental investor. Uh, <laughs> this was never in the plan. Um, I I worked in the corporate world for about twenty years. Uh, you know, uh, across financial services, telecom, media, technology, um, and uh, you know, I've known my uh, part. Uh, I've known my uh, you know partner Sunil Goyal for more than uh, more than 25, 27 years now. Actually, uh, you know, and we we overlapped in two companies. You know, so when uh, you know, uh, 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 when I was in Dabur Finance, Sunil was head of strategy for Dabur India. Then I moved to Airtel, which is a telco in the country, and then Sunil moved there, and then we overlapped again. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, and Sunil had been an angel investor in his personal capacity for many, many years. You know, and he'd made some very marquee investments like uh, Zipdial, which got acquired by Twitter. Uh, you know, so he came back uh, from his last assignment as uh, director for special projects in Africa for Bharti. Uh, and then updated his LinkedIn profile, uh, you know, in somewhere somewhere around this time of the year, uh, you know. Uh, and then I, uh, we were neighbors. We were literally living about a kilometer from each other. So you know, I called him up at ten thirty in the night uh, and asked him what he was doing. So he said he wanted to start a tech and tech enabled fund, uh, and he had already signed up with Sanjay Partey, who's you know, who's a, a executive coach, leadership uh, development mentor, uh, you know, profile. Uh, and they were looking for a tech uh, co-founder to come in uh, uh, as a partner in the fund. Um, uh, you know, so I was uh, I was at the peak of my career at the age of 41, uh, and then uh, you know I said let's meet and figure out where this is headed. So we met, uh, you know, spend uh, spend a few hours together, and there was a meeting of the mind, and that's how I came on came on board as a as a tech partner. So it was uh, literally serendipity, as I call it, uh, rather than any planned. Uh, Construct. It's been a very interesting journey. <laughs> yeah. Which are the critical points that trigger your decision to invest? Because you say so many decks, so many, you talk to so many funders, but in the end of the day, one day you need to invest more. Okay. Maybe, right. yeah, two, three, or four of them equally interesting. 
what was going to make the difference for you yeah so i think uh, i think the biggest uh, you know uh, point that i look at is how closely does this fit the investment thesis you know so so the investment thesis has been carved out and i i am the owner of the investment thesis to be honest it has been carved out by with a lot of you know focus and study of the ecosystem and what we think uh, you know would be out there 5 7 years from now you know so so for me that is extremely important you know if it doesn't fit our investment thesis then in all probability i will give it a pass but once the, once it passes that muster you know as i said then it's about people then it's about what the founders are bringing to the table you know what is their drive to solve the kind of problem they are trying to solve for what you know how how tenacious they are with respect to you know uh, solving the problem uh, you know how, when you talk to founders individually you, you know you realize that whether there is any formality of vision in terms of where they want to take the company or not so all that starts to play uh, you know in in the decision making uh, you know and once that is crossed you know uh, then you look at you know what is the product what is the ip portfolio does it have a ring fence uh, you know does it have a moat uh, uh, what is the kind of product market fit is there a, is it revenue model validated or not you know, so i have we have like a, a, a more than 150 plus you know parameters that we typically evaluate opportunities on on an ongoing basis broken into eight or nine heads okay uh, and 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 that's the kind of rigor that goes in evaluating an opportunity you know in our system for example uh, every partner uh, you know whether it is general partner or venture partner bring a very specific skill set to the table you know uh, so the opportunity uh, so the founders have to talk to each one of those each one of the partners because they bring a different perspective a different value add to the table uh, and then all of us kind of huddle together and figure out if uh, this is worth investing in or not and that i see the decision has to be unanimous you know so if there is even one dissenting vote we will we'll probably walk away from that opportunity so it's a, it's a fairly rigorous and evolved process that we have fine tuned over the last 10 years now and it's held us in very good stead what's your opinion the, the i know maybe there is not a, actually i don't think there is any but what can be a perfect receipt for a great pitch, a pitch that can convince you, what you should do? Yeah, so I think I think the biggest challenge I see uh, in pitches today is that uh, you know I, they're too long or they're too verbose. You know, <laughs> um, I think if if the founder is not able to sell a story in 10, 12 slides, uh, you know, then it becomes very difficult to keep uh, you know keep the attention. Uh, you know, so for me, I think. Uh, brevity uh, and and clarity of thought is extremely critical and how that comes out in the pitch you know i actually because that's the first touch point that we have with the with the opportunity right uh, you know if you're able to not pass that muster then it becomes you know in all probability uh, uh, you know you will not go to the next level uh, we are probably the only fund in the country max uh, where on the first call you get to speak to a partner okay uh, I manage the deal flow and, you know, every opportunity that I think kind of fits into our uh, construct, uh, I'm happy to get on a call and have a chat. You know, so I'm literally, the, literally in that sense, the gatekeeper. Uh, and, uh, you know, and for me, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, uh, that, that document that you send out to us for, for us to review the opportunity becomes extremely critical. And that's where, you know, I, I said gravity and clarity of thought kind of needs to come out very clearly. Uh, we've seen people, you know, there are eight or ten things that they need to talk in a pitch deck, you know. They have to talk about the team, which is very critical. They have to talk about the opportunity, how large it is. They have to talk about where they are, you know, uh, in terms of the life cycle of the product. They have to talk about, you know, what kind of customers do they have, what kind of revenue model do they have, what kind of GTM strategy, funnel velocity they have. And then they have to talk about how much money they want to raise, uh, you know, and, and where will that be utilized. Somewhere in the product, uh, when they talk about product, they have to talk about the kind of, you know, IP or moat they have created. If they cover these, you know, five or eight or ten, uh, you know, uh, uh, pieces of information, one per slide, I think they are sorted. Uh, more, more often than not, we see, uh, you know, a couple of these uh, headers missing from the deck. Uh, and that's then, and and then that, that that makes the process iterative. Then I have to go back, you know, it extends the timeline for the guy to get access to us and talk to us, uh, and that's never a good thing. You know, I I always 
advise uh, my founders that you know money in the bank today is is hundred times better than money in the bank two weeks from now. <laughs> you know, and therefore, uh, if you can, if you can, you know, be concise and uh, about what you are, what what is the opportunity that you are working on, and get to that call quickly. You know, it's all it's it uh, that's the best outcome that you can expect. What's to suggest to fund this when approaching a VC? How they should approach this? Yeah, so I think uh, I think I'll, I think I'll, uh, there is uh, today there is enough information about VCs available in the public domain. Like we do our homework on the opportunities, I think founders also need to do their homework in terms of trying to figure out who's the right VC for them. No, so all you know the investment pieces that we have, the kind of portfolio companies we have. You know the kind of ethos we have. Everything is available today in the public domain. You know uh, uh, our founders are connected to us on LinkedIn, etc. Uh, and, and therefore, my suggestion is that they should do their homework. They should go out and figure out, uh, you know, who are the top ten VCs for them uh, that can add value on the cap table for them. Okay, they should figure out, uh, you know, if I have already invested in uh, in if if I'm not a, for example. Uh, vertical focused fund, for example, if I'm not a fintech focused fund, and I've already made two investments in in, in, uh, in fintech, the probability that I will make a third investment in fintech from the same fund is few and far between. You know, and, and I've seen uh, uh, founders sometimes not go through that diligence when they are writing out those. I understand that, you know, they are in the market to raise money and color of the money does not matter and it does not matter where they get the money from, etc., etc. But it actually does. You know, and and uh, you know, if the founders realize that, you know, then that it, it becomes easier for us to uh, you know uh, get to closure. The other thing that I've seen some of the founders kind of miss out on is they also need to understand how our model works. At the end of the day, you know, um, my economic model is very simple. That if I if I cannot make ten x on an opportunity right up front, I will not, uh, you know, uh, not no, not even you know spend time on that opportunity, right? Uh, uh, and and if your business model is telling me that you know you can go from only you know hundred thousand dollars to two million in five years, then that probably is not a not a not a VC fundable investment. It may, it might be a very good lifestyle business. You can make three hundred thousand dollars in profit every year. You have the cash flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But will a VC truly fund something like this? Unlikely. You no. Know, so 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 if if the founders were to spend some time to understand what what are we looking for as investors. You know, uh, it it would help them target their communication more efficiently because every time you know the founder writes to a VC and the VC writes back, the founder has to spend time bandwidth, you know, to talk to that VC to explain him the business model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, it's not uh, uh, and and if, if and if you if, if your failure rate is nine out of ten, then you know you're really really spending time, you know, uh, uh, turning the wheels without getting without getting anywhere. It's like running on a treadmill, right? You know, so if, if the founders do that homework, uh, you know, and and real, and figure out who are the right set of people to go and talk to, uh, if they are able to find warm introductions, either to our founders or to our peers, etc., you know, it, it just accelerates the process to get the closure. What about IP? How important is for you that the IP belongs to the startup, to the founders for, for investing? With the thesis, the way it has evolved for us in fund two and fund three, IP is super critical for us. You know, especially in the because we sell to the enterprises. These are large contract values, you know, uh, and with very large default uh, clauses, etc. Uh, you know, so so for me, it is important that the product that is the foundation of your product, one is ground in solid technology, and two, you have you know enough ring fencing around around that technology for nobody to come in blindsided. You know, it, it, any any B two B sales cycle is a six nine month cycle, right? And therefore, if you're spending, you know, uh, six months to get a customer on board, and then you get blindsided three months later by somebody who says that I have a better technology, or you are infringing my IP, then that's not such a good place to be. You know, so we always kind of push our founders to not only create IP, but also be very, uh, uh, you know, very fastidious about evaluating the competitive landscape. You know, a lot of founders come to us saying that, you know, there's nothing like this that exists. I can guarantee you that, you know, if you dig deep enough, you will find, five, you know, 10, if not 50 opportunities. You know, and and uh, and, and uh, because we have a very strong deal, as I said, I get to see about 300 opportunities every month. You know, in all probability, what you sent to me, I would have seen something similar in the last five, seven years. 
you know so therefore if you don't come back to me uh, you know with, with with a detailed understanding of your competition you know then then that to my mind is a, is a negative mark uh, you know on the founder the economy so ip and competitive uh, you know uh, strategy or competitive landscape analysis to my mind are the two critical pieces that you cannot do without we in your opinion you have seen uh, talk to so many startups what can be the most promising sector for a founder today to get involved in the coming years yeah so as i said we are we are very deep tech focused so my uh, you know so my answer would be uh, you know grounded in that uh, uh, for us you know uh, some of the cutting edge technologies like uh, quantum computing uh, you know there's a lot of work, interesting work happening on industrial iot Uh, there's a lot of work happening on automation robotics etc you know so that we think are literally you know uh, uh, technologies of the future and and uh, you know we are happy to look at opportunities there are some that are out there uh, that are uh, that we think are uh, large enough but we don't have internal skill sets to value it that you know for example genomics is one of them you know we think it's very it, it, it will become fairly large uh, in the next 5 10 years we're trying to figure out how to build a thesis around it uh you know uh, we already have a thesis around uh, electric electric mobility i think that will become fairly large so we're looking at uh, you know directly electric mobility and adjacency in terms of fast charge infrastructure battery management system etc you know uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, interesting work happening on space tech you know we've not uh, we've seen pretty much everything that came out of india you know on space tech side of the world but we've not kind of taken the plunge we are we are trying to figure out if that is something that could be interesting there's a lot of work happening on the uh, climate side of the world you know green hydrogen and you know other 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 areas that are coming up you know those could be game changers in the next uh, next few years uh, so that's that's how you know i'm seeing the entire technological landscape evolving and we as a fund are are evolving as well you know uh, and continuing to add newer and newer verticals on the technology side into our fold uh, as an investment thesis Dirish, thank you so much for coming to the Investor Talk. It's been a very good pleasure for me. No, no, the pleasure is all mine, Max. And thank you so much again for thank having you. me here. Uh, I, you know, I hope this is useful to your viewers and listeners. Uh, you know, and happy to answer any follow-on questions that they have. I'm reachable, uh, you know, on Dirish dot Shivani at yourness dot uh, in, and I, and I clear my mailbox every night before I go to sleep. Uh, so if you write to me, you can expect a response. This has been extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. Take care. Have a good day.